At last the excitement had died out in Sambir. The inhabitants got used to the sight of comings and goings between Almeyer's house and the vessel, now moored to the opposite bank, and speculation as to the feverish activity displayed by Almeyer's boatmen in repairing old canoes ceased to interfere with the due discharge of domestic duties by the women of the settlement. Even the baffled Jim Eng left off troubling his muddled brain with secrets of trade and relapsed by the aid of his opium pipe into a state of stupefied bliss, letting Babalachi pursue his way past his house uninvited and seemingly unnoticed. So on that warm afternoon, when the deserted river sparkled under the vertical sun, the statesmen of Sembir could, without any hindrance from friendly inquirers, shove off his little canoe from under the bushes where it was usually hidden during his visits to Almeyer's compound. Slowly and languidly, Balachi paddled, crouching low in the boat, making himself small under his enormous sun hat to escape the scorching heat reflected from the water. He was not in a hurry. His master, Lakamba, was surely reposing at this time of the day. He would have ample time to cross over and greet him on his waking with important news. Will he be displeased? Will he strike his ebony wood staff angrily on the floor, frightening him by the incoherent violence of his exclamations? Or will he squat down with a good-humored smile and rubbing his hands gently over his stomach with a familiar gesture, expectorate copiously into the brass siri vessel, giving vent to a low, approbative murmur? Such were Babalachi's thoughts as he skillfully handled his paddle, crossing the river on his way to the Rajah's Kampong, whose stockades showed from behind the dense foliage of the bank just opposite to Almeyer's bungalow. Indeed, he had a report to make, something certain at last to confirm the daily tale of suspicions, the daily hints of familiarity, of stolen glances he had seen, of short and burning words he had overheard exchanged between Dane Marula and Almeyer's daughter. Lakamba had, till then, listened to it all, calmly, and with evident distrust. Now he was going to be convinced, for Balachi had the proof, had it this very morning, when fishing at break of day in the creek over which stood Bulangi's house. There from his skip he saw Nina's long canoe drift past, the girl sitting in the stern bending over Dane, who was stretched in the bottom with his head resting on the girl's knees. He saw it, he followed them, but in a short time they took to the paddles and got away from under his observant eye. A few minutes afterwards he saw Blangi's slave girl paddling in a small dugout to the town with her cakes for sale. She also had seen them in the gray dawn, and Babalachi grinned confidentially to himself at the recollection of the slave girl's discomposed face, of the hard look in her eyes, of the tremble in her voice when answering his questions. That little Tamina evidently admired Dane Murula. That was good. And Babalachi laughed aloud at the notion. Then becoming suddenly serious, he began, by some strange association of ideas, to speculate upon the price for which Balangi would possibly sell the girl. He shook his head sadly at the thought that Balangi was a hard man and had refused $100 for that same Tamina only a few weeks ago. Then he became suddenly aware that the canoe had drifted too far down during his meditation. He shook off the despondency caused by the certitude of Balangi's mercenary disposition and taking up his paddle in a few strokes sheared alongside the water gate of the Rajah's house. That afternoon, Almeyer, as was his wont lately, moved about on the waterside, overlooking the repairs to his boats. He had decided at last, guided by the scraps of information contained in old Lingard's pocket book, he was going to seek for the rich gold mine, for that place where he had only to stoop to gather up an immense fortune 
and realized the dream of his young days to obtain the necessary help he had shared his knowledge with Dane Marula, he had consented to be reconciled with Lakamba, who gave his support to the enterprise on condition of sharing the profits. He had sacrificed his pride, his honor, and his loyalty in the face of the enormous risk of his undertaking, dazzled by the greatness of the results to be achieved by this alliance, so distasteful yet so necessary. The dangers were great, but Marula was brave, his men seemed as reckless as their chief, and with Lakamba's aid success seemed assured. For the last fortnight Almeir was absorbed in the preparations, walking amongst his workmen and slaves in a kind of waking trance where practical details as to the fitting out of the boats were mixed up with vivid dreams of untold wealth, where the present misery of burning sun of the muddy and malodorous river bank disappeared in a gorgeous vision of a splendid future existence for himself and Nina. He hardly saw Nina during these last days, although the beloved daughter was ever present in his thoughts. He hardly took notice of Dane, whose constant presence in his house had become a matter of course to him now. They were connected by a community of interests. When meeting the young chief, he gave him an absent greeting and passed on, seemingly wishing to avoid him, bent upon forgetting the hated reality of the present by absorbing himself in his work, or else by letting his imagination soar far above the treetops into the great white clouds away to the westward, where the paradise of Europe was awaiting the future eastern millionaire. And Marula, now the bargain was struck and there was no more business to be talked over, evidently did not care for the white man's company. Yet Dane was always about the house, but he seldom stayed long by the riverside. On his daily visits to the white man, the Malay chief preferred to make his way quietly through the central passage of the house and would come out into the garden at the back where the fire was burning in the cooking shed, with the rice kettle swinging over it, under the watchful supervision of Mrs. Almayer. Avoiding that shed, with its black smoke and the warbling of soft feminine voices, Dane would turn to the left. There, on the edge of a banana plantation, a clump of palms and mango trees formed a shady spot, a few scattered bushes giving it a certain seclusion into which only the serving women's chatter or an occasional burst of laughter could penetrate. Once in, he was invisible, and hidden there, leaning against the smooth trunk of a tall palm, he waited with gleaming eyes and an assured smile to hear the faint rustle of dried grass under the light footsteps of Nina. From the very first moment when his eyes beheld this to him, perfection of loveliness, he felt in his inmost heart the conviction that she would be his. He felt the subtle breath of mutual understanding passing between their two savage natures, and he did not want Mrs. Almayer's encouraging smiles to take every opportunity of approaching the girl, and every time he spoke to her, every time he looked into her eyes, Nina, although averting her face, felt as if the bold-looking being who spoke burning words into her willing ear was the embodiment of her fate, the creature of her dreams, reckless, ferocious, ready with flashing criss for his enemies, and with passionate embrace for his beloved, the ideal Malay chief of her mother's tradition. She recognized with a thrill of delicious fear the mysterious consciousness of her identity with that being. Listening to his words, it seemed to her she was born only then to a knowledge of a new existence, that her life was complete only when near him, and she abandoned herself to a feeling of dreamy happiness, while with half-veiled face and in silence, as became a Malay girl, she listened to Dane's words giving up to her the whole treasure of love and passion his nature was capable of with all the unrestrained enthusiasm 
of a man totally untrammeled by any influence of civilized self-discipline. And they used to pass many a delicious and fast fleeting hour under the mango trees behind the friendly curtain of bushes till Mrs. Almayer's shrill voice gave the signal of unwilling separation. Mrs. Almayer had undertaken the easy task of watching her husband lest he should interrupt the smooth course of her daughter's love affair, in which she took a great and benignant interest. She was happy and proud to see Dane's infatuation, believing him to be a great and powerful chief, and she found also a gratification of her mercenary instincts in Dane's open-handed generosity. On the eve of the day when Babalachi's suspicions were confirmed by ocular demonstration, Dane and Nina had remained longer than usual in their shady retreat. Only Almayer's heavy step on the veranda and his querulous clamor for food decided Mrs. Almayer to lift a warning cry. Marula leaped lightly over the low bamboo fence and made his way stealthily through the banana plantation down to the muddy shore of the back creek, while Nina walked slowly towards the house to minister to her father's wants, as was her wont every evening. Almayer felt happy enough that evening. The preparations were nearly completed. Tomorrow he would launch his boats. In his mind's eye he saw the rich prize in his grasp, and with tin spoon in his hand he was forgetting the plateful of rice before him and the fanciful arrangement of some splendid banquet to take place on his arrival in Amsterdam. Nina, reclining on the long chair, listened absently to the few disconnected words escaping from her father's lips. Expedition, gold. What did she care for all that? But at the name of Marula mentioned by her father, she was all attention. Dane was going down the river with his brig tomorrow to remain away for a few days, said Almayer. It was very annoying, this delay. As soon as Dane returned, they would have to start without loss of time, for the river was rising. He would not be surprised if a great flood was coming, and he pushed away his plate with an impatient gesture on rising from the table. But now Nina heard him not. Dane going away. That's why he had ordered her with that quiet masterfulness it was her delight to obey, to meet him at break of day in Bolangi's Creek. Was there a paddle in her canoe, she thought? Was it ready? She would have to start early, at four in the morning, in a very few hours. She rose from her chair, thinking she would require rest before the long pull in the early morning. The lamp was burning dimly, and her father, tired with the day's labor, was already in his hammock. Nina put the lamp out and passed into a large room she shared with her mother on the left of the central passage. Entering, she saw that Mrs. Almayer had deserted the pile of mats, serving her as bed in one corner of the room, and was now bending over the open lid of her large wooden chest. Half a shell of coconut filled with oil, or a cotton rag floated for a wick, stood on the floor surrounding her with a ruddy halo of light shining through the black and odorous smoke. Mrs. Almayer's back was bent, and her head and shoulders hidden in the deep box. Her hands rummaged in the interior, where a soft clink, as of silver money, could be heard. She did not notice at first her daughter's approach, and Nina, standing silently by her, looked down on many little canvas bags ranged in the bottom of the chest, wherefrom her mother extracted handfuls of shining guilders and Mexican dollars, letting them stream slowly back again through her claw-like fingers. The music of tinkling silver seemed to delight her, and her eyes sparkled with the reflected gleam of freshly minted coins. She was muttering to herself, and this, and this, and yet this. Soon he will give more, as much more as I ask. He is a great Raja, a son of heaven. 
and she will be a Rani. He gave all this for her. Whoever gave anything for me, I am a slave. Am I? I am the mother of a great Rani. She became aware suddenly of her daughter's presence and ceased her droning, shutting the lid down violently. Then, without rising from her crouching position, she looked up at the girl standing by with a vague smile on her dreamy face. You have seen, have you? she shouted shrilly. That is all mine, and for you. It is not enough. He will have to give more before he takes you away to the southern island where his father is king. You hear me? You are worth more, granddaughter of Rajas, more, more. The sleepy voice of Almayer was heard on the veranda, recommending silence. Mrs. Almayer extinguished the light and crept into her corner of the room. Nina lay down on her back on a pile of soft mats, her hands entwined under her head, gazing through the shutterless hole, serving as a window at the stars twinkling on the black sky. She was awaiting the time to start for her appointed meeting place. With quiet happiness, she thought of that meeting in the great forest, far from all human eyes and sounds, her soul lapsing again into the savage mood which the genius of civilization working by the hand of Mrs. Vink could never destroy, experienced a feeling of pride and of some slight trouble at the high value of her worldly wise mother had put upon her person. But she remembered the expressive glances and words of Dane, and tranquilized, she closed her eyes in a shiver of pleasant anticipation. There are some situations where the barbarian and the so-called civilized man meet upon the same ground. It may be supposed that Dane Marula was not exceptionally delighted with his prospective mother-in-law, nor that he actually approved of that worthy woman's appetite for shining dollars. Yet on that foggy morning, when Babalachi, laying aside the cares of state, went to visit his fish baskets in the Bulangi Creek, Marula had no misgivings, experienced no feelings but those of impatience and longing when paddling to the east side of the island, forming the backwater in, the, in question. He hid his canoe in the bushes and strode rapidly across the islet, pushing with impatience through the twigs of heavy undergrowth, intercrossed over his path. From motives of prudence, he would not take his canoe to the meeting place, as Nina had done. He had left it in the main stream till his return from the other side of the island. The heavy, warm fog was closing rapidly round him, but he managed to catch a fleeting glimpse of a light away to the left, proceeding from Balangi's house. Then he could see nothing in the thickening vapor and kept the path only by a sort of instinct which also led him to the very point on the opposite shore he wished to reach. A great log had stranded there, at right angles to the bank, forming a kind of jetty against which the swiftly flowing stream broke with a loud ripple. He stepped on it with a quick but steady motion, and in two strides found himself at the outer end, with the rush and swirl of the foaming water at his feet. Standing there alone, as if separated from the world, the heavens, earth, the very water roaring under him swallowed up in the thick veil of the morning fog, he breathed out the name of Nina before him into the apparently limitless space, sure of being heard, instinctively sure of the nearness of the delightful creature, certain of her being aware of his near presence as he was of hers. The bow of Nina's canoe loomed up close to the log, canted high out of the water by the weight and the sitter in the stern. Marula laid his hand on the stem and leaped lightly in, giving it a vigorous shove off. The light craft, obeying the new impulse, cleared the log by a hair's breadth, and the river, with obedient complicity, swung its broadside to the current and bore it off silently and rapidly between the invisible banks. And once more, Dane, at the feet of Nina, forgot the world. 
felt himself carried away helplessly by a great wave of supreme emotion, by a rush of joy, pride, and desire, understood once more with overpowering certitude that there was no life possible without that being he held clasped in his arms with passionate strength and a prolonged embrace. Nina engaged herself gently with a low laugh. You will overturn the boat, Dane, she whispered. He looked into her eyes eagerly for a minute and let her go with a sigh. Then lying down in the canoe, he put his head on her knees, gazing upwards and stretching his arms backwards till his hands met round the girl's waist. She bent over him and, shaking her head, framed both their faces in the falling locks of her long black hair. And so they drifted on, he speaking with all the rude eloquence of a savage nature giving itself up without restraint to an overmastering passion, she bending low to catch the murmur of words sweeter to her than life itself. To those two, nothing existed then outside the gun walls of the narrow and fragile craft. It was their world, filled with their intense and all-absorbing love. They took no heed of thickening mist or of the breeze dying away before sunrise. They forgot the existence of the great forests surrounding them, of all the tropical nature awaiting the advent of the sun in a solemn and impressive silence. Over the low river mist, hiding the boat with its freight of young passionate life and all forgetful happiness, the stars paled, and a silvery gray tint crept over the sky from the eastward. There was not a breath of wind, not a rustle of stirring leaf, not a splash of leaping fish to disturb the serene repose of all living things on the banks of the great river. Earth, river, and sky were wrapped up in a deep sleep from which it seemed there would be no waking. All the seething life and movement of tropical nature seemed concentrated in the ardent eyes and the tumultuous beating hearts of the two beings drifting in the canoe under the white canopy of mist over the smooth surface of the river. Suddenly a great sheaf of yellow rays shot upwards from behind the black curtain of trees lining the banks of the Pante. The stars went out. The little black clouds of the zenith glowed for a moment with crimson tints and with thick mist stirred by the gentle breeze, the sigh of waking nature whirled round and broke into fantastically torn pieces, disclosing the wrinkled surface of the river sparkling in the broad light of day. Great flocks of white birds wheeled, screaming above the swaying treetops. The sun had risen on the east coast. Dane was the first to return to the cares of everyday life. He rose and glanced rapidly up and down the river. His eye detected Babalachi's boat astern and another small black speck on the glittering water, which was Tamina's canoe. He moved cautiously forward and, kneeling, took up a paddle. Nina at the stern took hers. They bent their bodies to the work throwing up the water at every stroke, and the small craft went swiftly ahead, leaving a narrow wake fringed with a lace-like border of white and gleaming foam. Without turning his head, Dane spoke. Somebody behind us, Nina. We must not let him gain. I think he is too far to recognize us. Somebody before us also, panted out Nina, without ceasing to paddle. I think I know, rejoined Dane. The sun shines over there, but I fancy it is the girl Tamana. She comes down every morning to my brig to sell cakes, stays often all day. It does not matter. Steer more into the bank. We must get under the bushes. My canoe is hidden not far from here. As he spoke, his eyes watched the broad-leaved nippas, which they were brushing, and their swift and silent course. Look out, Nina, he said at last, there, where the water palms end and the twigs hang down under the leaning tree, 
stir for the big green branch. He stood up attentive, and the boat drifted slowly inshore, Nita guiding it by a gentle and skillful movement of her paddle. When near enough, Dane laid hold of the big branch, and leaning back, shot the canoe under a low green archway of thickly matted creepers, giving access to a miniature bay formed by the caving in of the bank during the last great flood. His own boat was there anchored by a stone, and he stepped into it, keeping his hand on the gunwale of Nina's canoe. In a moment, the two little nutshells with their occupants floated quietly side by side, reflected by the black water in the dim light struggling through the high canopy of dense foliage, while above, away up in the broad day, flamed immense and red blossoms, sending down on their heads a shower of great dew-sparkling petals that descended, rotating slowly in a continuous and perfumed stream. And over them, under them, in the sleeping water, all around them in a ring of luxuriant vegetation, bathed in the warm air, charged with strong and harsh perfumes, the intense work of tropical nature went on, plants shooting upward, entwined, interlaced, in inextricable confusion, climbing madly and brutally over each other in the terrible silence of a desperate struggle towards the life-giving sunshine above. As if struck with sudden horror at the seething mass of corruption below, at the death and decay from which they sprang. We must part now, said Dane, after a long silence. You must return at once, Nina. I will wait till the brig drifts down here and shall get on board then. And you will be long away, Dane, asked Nina in a low voice. Long, exclaimed Dane. Would a man willingly remain long in a dark place when I am not near you, Nina? I am like a man that is blind. What is life to me without life? Nina leaned over and, with a proud and happy smile, took Dane's face between her hands, looking into his eyes with a fond yet questioning gaze. Apparently she found there the confirmation of the words just said, for a feeling of grateful security lightened for her the weight of sorrow at the hour of parting. She believed that he, the descendant of many great rajas, the son of a great chief, the master of life and death, knew the sunshine of life only in her presence. An immense wave of gratitude and love welled forth out of her heart towards him. How could she make an outward and visible sign of all she felt for the man who had filled her heart with so much joy and so much pride? And in the great tumult of passion, like a flash of lightning, came to her the reminiscence of that despised and almost forgotten civilization she had only glanced at in her days of restraint, of sorrow, and of anger. In the cold ashes of that hateful and miserable past, she would find the sign of love, the fitting expression of the boundless felicity of the present, the pledge of a bright and splendid future. She threw her arms around Dane's neck, and pressed her lips to his in a long and burning kiss. He closed his eyes, surprised and frightened at the storm raised in her breast by the strange and to him hitherto unknown contact, and long after Nina had pushed her canoe into the river, he remained motionless, without daring to open his eyes, afraid to lose the sensation of intoxicating delight he had tasted for the first time. Now he wanted but immortality, he thought, to be the equal of God's, and the creature that could open so the gates of paradise must be his, soon would be his forever. He opened his eyes in time to see through the archway of creepers the bows of his brig come slowly into view as the vessel drifted past on its way down the river. He must go on board now. He thought, yet 
he was loath to leave the place where he had learned to know what happiness meant. Time yet, let them go, he muttered to himself, and he closed his eyes again under the red shower of scented petals, trying to recall the scene with all its delight and all its fear. He must have been able to join his brig in time after all, and found much occupation outside, for it was in vain that Almayer looked for his friend's speedy return. The lower reach of the river, where he so often and so impatiently directed his eyes, remained deserted, save for the rapid flitting of some fishing canoe. But down the upper reaches came black clouds and heavy showers, heralding the final setting in of the rainy season, with its thunderstorms and great floods making the river almost impossible of ascent for native canoes. Almayer, strolling along the muddy beach between his houses, watched uneasily the river rising inch by inch, creeping slowly nearer to the boats, now ready and hauled up in a row under the cover of dripping kajang mats. Fortune seemed to elude his grasp, and in his weary tramp backwards and forwards under the steady rain falling from the lowering sky, a sort of despairing indifference took possession of him. What did it matter? It was just his luck. Those two infernal savages, Lakamba and Dane, induced him, with their promises of help, to spend his last dollar in the fitting out of boats. And now one of them was gone somewhere, and the other shut up in his stockade would give no sign of life. No, not even the scoundrelly Babalachi, thought Almayer, would show his face near him. Now they had sold him all the rice, brass gongs, and cloth necessary for his expedition. They had his very last coin and did not care whether he went or stayed. And with a gesture of abandoned discouragement, Almayer would climb up slowly to the veranda of his new house to get out of the rain, and leaning on the front rail with his head sunk between his shoulders, he would abandon himself to the current of bitter thoughts, oblivious of the flight of time and the pangs of hunger, deaf to the shrill cries of his wife calling him to the evening meal, when roused from his sad meditations by the first roll of the evening thunderstorm, he stumbled slowly towards the glimmering light of his old house, his half-dead hope made his ears preternaturally acute to any sound on the river. Several nights in succession he had heard the splash of paddles and had seen the indistinct form of a boat, but when hailing the shadowy apparition, his heart bounding with sudden hope of hearing Dane's voice, he was disappointed each time by the sulky answer conveying to him the intelligence that the Arabs were on the river, bound on a visit to the homestaying Lakamba. This caused him many sleepless nights, spent in speculating upon the kind of villainy those estimable personages were hatching now. At last, when all hope seemed dead, he was overjoyed on hearing Dane's voice, but Dane also appeared very anxious to see Lakamba, and Almayer felt uneasy owing to a deep and ineradicable distrust as to that ruler's disposition towards himself. Still, Dane had returned at last. Evidently, he meant to keep to his bargain. Hope revived, and that night Almayer slept soundly, while Nina watched the angry river under the lash of the thunderstorm sweeping onward towards the sea.